I'm going to make my part of this very brief. Uh, I mainly want to just thank a whole lot of people. Uh, and I want to start with our speakers. So uh, uh, they'll be coming up afterwards, and we'll do them in a row. Uh, Shane Knapp from the RISE Lab is going to talk about uh, his work managing a lot of uh, AWS and other cloud uh, provisioning for researchers. Uh, Lindsay Hagee is going to, she's doing large scale uh, research <coughs> computing. Uh, she's a member of Jupiter Project. It's, it's very cool. Um, and then Lucas, uh, who's here somewhere from DevSpace, uh, they're a Skydeck company. Uh, they make managing Kubernetes uh, clusters pain free. So we all are going to want to really care about that. Uh, and I want to thank my co organizers. Uh, so Anthony, uh, stand up Anthony, and he's been great in, in uh, really getting this off the ground and was one of the first movers in sort of talking about getting a community around cloud. Here, uh, Sybil Chen is the program director at the Skydeck, and she's going to be speaking a little bit uh, just about what's going on at the Skydeck. Uh, Jason and Christopher, in research IT. Um, I, I also want to give a shout out to Gene Cheng from the Academic, Inno Academic Innovation Studio. If you haven't been to it, go to ais.berkeley.edu. She is an expert on dealing with innovation in higher ed and thinking about technology in creative ways, and also is great at helping us think through how a meetup should work. Um, I should point out my two bosses are here. Uh, Larry Conrad is the university's chief information officer, and Jen Stringer. Okay, she just walked out. Um, <laughs> my brand new boss. Um, and let's see. And then I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, so Carolyn Winnett couldn't be here. She's the executive director of the Skydeck. Everything you see here, from the sign on the top of the building to the new space they're building out on the third floor, that's the product of her vision and the amazing team that she's put together. Um, and Gordon also has done an amazing job helping us get all the logistics uh, ready for tonight. Uh, and I want to uh, give a shout out to Catherine Carson. She's going to be speaking in a minute. Uh, she is the faculty, let's see if I get this right, the faculty lead of the Data Sciences Education Program and the professor here of history. Um, to get a new division and an interdisciplinary division kind of off the ground requires a lot of intellectual and other heavy lifting and a lot of the credit uh, goes, I think, to Catherine. She would probably deny that, but that's right. <laughs> I'm used to a lot of skepticism. Uh, so one question I wanted to just tackle up front is why a cloud meetup? Like why are we doing this? And I would posit that the answer is right here in the room. And so I need to gather some data about this. So I want to do a quick poll. And anyone who is an academic, a student, faculty, or researcher, raise your hand. So how many? So we've got a bunch of them. Uh, and then anyone on the staff here? If you're on the staff, raise your hand. So we've got a lot, this includes our IT staff. Um, let's see. Um, any Skydeck companies or other entrepreneurial ecosystem people? So we have a couple, three, probably three or four companies represented there. And then who found out about this on meetup.com is just um, local. So we've got Yay. a bunch of them. Oh, great. Um, now, of all of those people, how many are Berkeley alum, alumni? So we have a lot of alumni also here. So that is why. Um, research universities are very decentralized. We barely even talk to each other about stuff. The hardest part of my job is to try to get people to do things more similarly and less divergently when we really have no sticks and our carrots are fairly pathetic. So, Getting people together and talking and starting with the people side of this, I think, is really the way to go. Uh, and that's why we're doing it. And sort of, sort of put that to the test also. It's a meetup, so people are here to meet each other. So would you please take a minute and introduce yourself to the people on either side of you and just say what it is you do, someone you haven't met before, and uh, what brought you to <laughs> Thanks, Bill. I'm, I'm just delighted to be part of welcoming you to this first cloud meetup, and I don't want to stand in between you and Shane um, or any of the presentations that will follow, but I do want to bring out and make visible and articulated this great energy and enthusiasm and bottom-up innovation that Bill and Anthony and all of the organizers and all of you 
have made possible coming together here. Uh, Bill mentioned that the Division of Data Sciences is a new, emergent, and very, very fast-moving organization. And because we try to teach at scale in new and innovative ways, we found ourselves moving faster and faster into the cloud in ways that we had some inkling of when we started the program back three and a half years ago. But the acceleration of the technological developments and the uptake have been so fascinating to be part of watching. As Bill mentioned, I'm a historian, and I think this is a moment of radical, fast change. And to be able to see a community coming together from inside and outside the university to discuss where it's going and how we can adapt to it is to me really thrilling to be able to be part of. And so I feel the energy in the room. I am really excited to see each of the presentations. And I above all want to reinforce Bill's sense that we can do this together, that each of us brings something to the table here, and to be able to see the university move in particular as fast into this space as we've moved into data science education, touching thousands of students a semester through our cloud-based platform. That gives me great hope. We can bring that energy into moving our institutions forward. And so I'm thrilled for the chance to be up here at Skydeck, which also has that spirit, and would like to pass it over to a brief, brief presentation, brief presentation about the opportunities that you have here too. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to give a quick, quick welcome to all of you. This is by a quick show of hands. How many uh, for how many of you is this your very first time visiting Skydeck? Wow. Okay. Great. Well, yeah. What a what a pleasure to ha host all of you guys here. When Bill mentioned the idea um, of hosting at Skydeck, right, we Caroline and the rest of the team immediately said yes. Um, we're really excited, and anything that we can do to support the community, we're happy to. Um, I think some of the next upcoming events may also be here as well, so we look forward to seeing you many times through. But a, quick, a, a few quick words about Skydeck. For those of you that don't know too much about us, we're one of the tech accelerators in Berkeley, and right now we have 120 startup teams coming through our office every semester. Um, there are two tracks, so it's a cohort track. So those are the teams that, there are 20 teams that we invest in. Uh, that's usually 100K, and you know we work really closely with them to help them, you know, get to a point where they can successful, success, successfully raise their seed round or a Series A. Um, and then there's another 100 hot test um, track, 100 teams that are a little bit earlier stage. Maybe they have a prototype or MVP, and they're iterating. And all of these teams come to Skydeck. They access our programming. We have countless workshops, firesides, lunch and learns, and we also have a vast advisor network, which Bill is actually one of our Sky Advisors. So we pair our teams with advisors who are experts in the industry that they're in, and they get really strategic help and advice, warm introductions. And for any of you guys who may know founders that are looking for an environment or ecosystem that they can plug into and really get some help, Skydeck has an open door policy. We're here to really support Cal founders and you know it's really easy to plug into our network at whatever stage a startup is at. So our next application session opens on April 1st. If you know any founders that you think might be interested in learning more on April 1st, send them to skydeck.berkeley.edu and they can basically apply very easily to join our ecosystem. We, have, we usually have about a thousand, we're probably we're anticipating a thousand applications for this next cohort, so it is competitive. But again, like we're very, you know, for us, we're all about supporting founders and startups uh, around Berkeley. So thank you, for Bill, for inviting us to host, and we're happy to support you guys. Hope you guys enjoy the evening. Science Division, um, specifically for RISE Lab. Uh, we do a lot of cool stuff. Um, graduate Research Lab, 
uh, work a lot on machine learning, reinforcement learning, uh, AI, model serving. Um, I also manage the technical staff across a bunch of different um, research labs as well. And I run the Apache Spark open source code system. So I, I've got a few hats. Um, on top of all that, we host a massive AWS um, organized, uh, consolidated billing families. And we have well over 175 linked accounts. I should have actually checked today. I think we're closer to 200. Um, we, We also support other cloud providers, but not very, but not as much as AWS. Uh, Amazon is one of our corporate sponsors for the lab, so we deal with a lot of research credits. We actually don't really pay our own bills. Um, thank you, Matt Jameson, for that. So, why the cloud, especially in research? You know, we focus on really high accuracy and low latency secure systems, and <clears throat> the cloud gives us, you know, a really good opportunity to configure everything to what the, actually we allow the researchers to run all of this stuff and they can configure every all their systems as they need it. Um, you know, low latency availability if they want brand new shiny GPUs or systems with 128 gigs of RAM or even more then you know they can just get that. Um, we have a lot of students doing a lot of research. And you know, hardware is expensive. So the upfront costs of buying a box with eight GPUs, you know, <clears throat> that costs something. And then the OPEX, you know, how do you manage these boxes? How do you, you have to have the staff hire to take care of it? So the cloud is pretty much a no-brainer, you would think. So how do we do it? Linked accounts. So we have a central paying account, and I'm actually gonna just jump in really quick. I'm not gonna be, this is not gonna be a technical talk about how we deploy things in the cloud, because we actually don't manage any of that. We give the students and the researchers the power to do this themselves. We don't wanna get in the way. And with so many linked accounts, there's no way I could come up with some sort of infrastructure that could be shared amongst all these students with different projects doing different things. So, with Amazon as our sponsor, we have a consolidated billing family. We get a lot of credits as our sponsorship deal. Um, we have people invited into our org, and they don't see a bill. So, they just spend, 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 and we pay for it. Um, also, the reason why we like the cloud is by the time students actually get into grad school, they've been using AWS or other cloud providers for years. So this is a real no-brainer for them. Like, they know what to do when they come in. They know how to spin up instances. They know how to save their AMIs. You know, it's, it, I think I've had to give probably two hours of technical support on using AWS in the five years I've been at Cal. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Uh, I mean, seriously. And again, you know, the, all the permutations of the configurations, memory, CPUs, GPUs, networking, lambdas, you know, just it's a really powerful, flexible system for researchers. Um, and in conjunction with bare metal, so we actually do have a pretty significant amount of machines uh, up in Soda Hall, and we work with the researchers so they can actually prototype their experiments on bare metal, figure out what they want to run and how they're going to run it, and then fine tune their spends and their systems on AWS. Um, it's a lot less work for us, for the most part, and um, we provide a lot of feedback to our industry partners. Look at you, Matt. So, what's the result? Many of the GPU and CPU hours were consumed and much research was completed. I mean, we do a lot of work. Um, if you look up this one project called Pyren, P-Y-W-R-E-N, that came out of a partnership with our lab, uh, with RISE Lab and BCCI, which is a different research lab. Um, the lamb is at scale. It's, it's amazing. Happy grad students and faculty. Many, many, many credits burned. Lots of stress for me for a while. A lot more work than I initially anticipated. And out of that, I wrote a thousand lines of Python to parse billing and release that open source. <laughs> Not only is it a thousand lines of Python, it's an NRE tree implementation in Python to use the organizational units. And the other thing that happened is we significantly expanded our local pool of GPUs. <laughs> Reason why? We were burning at one point over $2,000 a day on GPUs <clears throat> on Amazon. So doing the math, I went to my PI and I'm like, hey, if we cut GPU, you know, take, multiply that by 10, 10 days of GPU usage, that's $26,000. We can buy an amazingly good expandable box for, for that much money. So it's interesting. 
we moved to the cloud, found out all the problems with the cloud. <laughs> We're not a startup. We don't know that like our QA team and our dev team and our release teams are going to be using just these amount of resources. You know, it's like, oh, an SDI paper is due, spends just spike up. You know, so we just had to really kind of figure out a good balance of actual on-prem bare metal versus what's out there in the ether. So how is it to manage something like this? It's first bullet point says it all. It's easy except when it's not. Um, we're not centrally managed, and we don't have insight into what all these students are doing with the cloud. Um, billing, billing, billing. This is the biggest problem we have with the cloud. How much are you going to spend? Can you can you forecast spends? Can you figure out like is the paper due? So what's the burn going to look like leading up to the paper? Um, have I mentioned the number of accounts and projects we have? Um, the learning curve to get people to migrate is really not that bad. Um, going back to bursty workflows and unique usage patterns, I mean, you, you never know when someone has a paper due or someone's got a job interview at some university and they have to get a paper out. Um, billing, again, I really can't stress this enough. If you're using research credits, the built-in billing system in, in AWS does not support this very well at all, at all. I can't get how many credits I have remaining short of going to a web page and copying and pasting. There's no API access for stuff like this. So it just makes it really, really difficult. Um, other problems like cost and availability of, of new, um, newer instance types, specifically GPUs and FPGAs now. We're doing a lot of work with those. That has gotten better as um, Amazon has been kind of like expanding their, their hardware. Um, and then a thousand lines of Python just to parse a billing file. That's it. Thank you. Hello. It's good to be here. Um, so I'm going to be telling you a bit about the Jupiter project and how that is enabling geoscience. Uh, so first, I want to give you just a bit of an idea of my background. Uh, so I moved here uh, just at the beginning of the year. I did my PhD up at UBC in Vancouver in geophysics. Uh, and so a lot of my thesis work was looking at electromagnetic inverse problems. So you fly a helicopter around, we collect some electromagnetic data, and then from that, what we're going to try and do is back out a 3D physical property model of the subsurface. Um, and so that can be important, especially in California right now, when people are trying to understand how much groundwater we have, or where there are clay layers that protect the groundwater. Um, so that's, that's a lot of my thesis work. Um, and how that brought me into open source software is that you need to be able to solve partial differential equations. We need to figure out and try and estimate what those data should look like if we know what the Earth model is. And then from that, we can try and formulate an optimization problem to figure out that 3D subsurface model um, from the data that we collected. So I ended up writing a lot of code, uh, and that brought me into the open source software world. Um, and so that brought me into Python and also into uh, Jupyter. And with that, seeing how powerful of a tool it was for my own research, I got very excited about also applications uh, for education. And so have done a lot of work um, looking at how to make education um, much more interactive uh, using tools like Jupyter. Um, so if we ask the question, what actually is driving progress in the geosciences? What do geoscientists think about when they're doing research? Um, it's really this interwoven uh, path of theory and ideas uh, that we check with observations and data. Uh, and then we also need simulations and computations uh, to try and understand what's going on. So that image here uh, on the left, that is a magnetic map. And so this is very high resolution magnetic data. I just picked one patch of it. This actually covers the whole Earth. Um, there's over 11 million lines uh, and surveys that were all connected to make this data set. So there's a lot going on in there. From there, we can, there's actually a lot of evidence for um, plate tectonics. So you can see a lot of the striping. So if you see the striping just off the coast of California, that's one of the key insights that let us know that plate tectonics is going on. Um, so that's just one observation from the data. But then one of the things that we want to do is actually take those data and try and perform some computations to figure out what the crustal structure is. Um, so that involves uh, a lot of then solving Maxwell's equation. So this is where the cloud starts coming in. 
for quite a number of years, we could work with data on our, our local hardware uh, and solve these equations locally, but now the data is getting big enough and the problems are getting complex enough that we need to move to the cloud. Um, so just highlighting some of the problems we encounter in research. There are problems, uh, challenges with software. So traditionally, a lot of academic research has been driven by proprietary software. Uh, it's not interoperable, so a research group over here learns how to solve the magnetic equation, research group over here solves Maxwell's equations, uh, and they just don't connect. And so that really hinders a lot of progress. Um, now we're getting to the point where the data sets are large enough that you can't work with them locally, uh, so we need to be accessing them on the cloud. And then this imposes challenges on researchers. You need to learn a whole new set of tools. Um, and you need to learn how to transfer your prototyping workflow from your laptop up to the cloud. And so I think it's important to remember who the audience is and what these tools need to accomplish here. Um, we're not doing computing for computing's sake. We need the tools to solve a problem. Uh, we need to be able to enable exploration. Researchers need to be able to act interactively with the code um, to gain insights. And then at the end of the day, we need to be able to communicate those results and share them, uh, both with other researchers and with the general public. And all of these things, hopefully, should not be posing too much um, cognitive load on the researchers. We want to be focusing on the research, not fighting with the computer. So I want to give you just a bit of a tour of what a geoscientist uh, nowadays is using in uh, a computational workflow. I start with the scientific Python ecosystem. Uh, similar diagrams could be made for Julia and R and uh, uh, several other open source languages, but Python is one of the largest um, and growing communities at this point in time. So it's probably the most commonly used in the open geoscience world. So at the bottom there we have Python. Um, and then as you move up through these layers, uh, you're able to like, leverage pieces below you. So for example, NumPy takes care of linear algebra. So when I learn to write my differential equations, I don't actually have to go and figure out all the matrix solving and all of that sort of stuff. That's just taken care of. Um, one piece that I want to focus on here is Jupyter. Uh, so although this is inside of the Python ecosystem, uh, Jupyter is actually language agnostic, so we can equally plug Jupyter into a Julia diagram or an R diagram. Uh, and I want to show you a bit of what it enables. Uh, so when people ask what is Jupyter, uh, it's a very big question, because if you just try and define an ecosystem, I've just written down a few of the packages there at the bottom. It's very big. There's lots of software that goes into Jupyter. Uh, but if we describe the mission, I would call it, it is a community of people and an ecosystem of tools, all dedicated to interactive computing. And so the way most people are aware of Jupyter is through the Jupyter Notebook. So the Jupyter Notebook is a document that combines com combine text and equations, uh, with software code that you can actually run in this document, as well as outputs. Um, so those can be figures, it also plugs in with things like widgets, so you can actually start making your code much richer and much more interactive. So that runs on your local machine, but now we want to actually start, oops, uh, sorry. Uh, so the, the Jupyter Notebook, what it actually is, is we can think of it as being composed of like three different things. It is a document, so it is that, that document that you're looking at of equations and code. Um, but it's also an interface and an environment. So the document itself is actually represented as just a JSON structure. And so what that means is we can actually strap on different interfaces to it, uh, something like Interact that uh, Netflix uses. Uh, it's built on the same document structure, and it's just a simpler interface, similar with our, like our studio. So depending on what problem you need to solve, we can actually um, compose different pieces uh, to, to deal with the problem that you're working on. So that's a running Jupyter instance, but how do we actually then connect researchers with that compute environment? And this is where Jupyter Hub comes in. Um, so Jupyter Hub can be deployed on an HPC system up on the cloud, and it actually allows users to log in and access their own uh, Jupyter environment. So it handles authentication, it handles um, the resource allocation, um, storage, all of those sorts of things that you as a researcher just don't want to have to think about. And what's great is, is it's the exact same interface as what I would be running on my local laptop. So the interface in my interaction has not fundamentally changed. 
once you've gone through and actually done some of your research, how do you actually share this now with collaborators or publish it with your paper? Uh, and this is where the Binder project comes in. And so Binder combines a lot of the infrastructure that Jupyter Hub uh, has for building your software environment um, and deploying that on the cloud to actually allow you to generate a URL that you can give to anybody from your GitHub repository that'll spin up a compute instance for you. So if you have your GitHub repository of Jupyter Notebooks and you define what needs to be in that software environment, we can build that for you on Binder and give you a link that you can then pass on to anyone to reproduce your results. So that's a fair bit of tech, but what does this actually have to do with the geosciences and how does this enable geoscience research? Uh, and this is where I'm very excited to see the progress that's being made in the Pangeo project. And so the way that they've branded themselves is it's a community-driven uh, effort for big data geosciences. And so what that actually means is they have combined a whole bunch of tools in the open source ecosystem in a way that's tailored to geoscientists. So they have uh, advocated to have analysis-ready data. So they've worked with NOAA and uh, NASA and quite a number of other large organizations to get the data stored in a cloud-friendly format up on the cloud. Then they've been working with researchers uh, to help implement um, scalable components like DASC and X-Array into their code. So that lets you parallelize research code. Then by using something like JupyterHub, you can package all of that up, deploy it on the cloud, so now you've got your compute resources next to your data, and you can start performing your geoscience analysis. So Pangeo, in a lot of ways, is just a collection of resources that's, that's tailored to geoscientists. Um, so they have deployed on uh, both HPC systems as well as the cloud. Um, and again, what's neat about this is if you are a researcher doing atmospheric research and some of your data is on NCAR and some of it's on AWS, you're going to be using the same Jupyter interface to interact with your data no matter what. So they've deployed um, several different instances that are tailored to different communities. So there's some looking at polar research. Uh, some looking at oceanography, some at hydrology. Uh, there's even groups that have adapted this for neuroscience. So it's not just geoscience. This whole idea is starting to expand. Um, and so there are, they've been successful in just the, over the past couple of years of gaining thousands of users at this point, um, which I think is a real testament to the way that they've developed. And the way that they've developed, and I think the way that, that Jupyter has developed, and some key pieces that I think make both of these projects successful, are that they are modular building blocks. So we're building building blocks that interoperate with each other and with software that already exists and is used in the open source ecosystem. Uh, the other thing that I think makes these projects successful is that they are built in conjunction with researchers who are using them. So the Pangeo project includes um, software developers who are with um, Anaconda, but it also includes researchers who are doing uh, hydrology work. And so by having them working together on one, uh, one project, you, you learn a lot and you make sure that the tools that you are building are always solving the researchers' problems. Um, so with that, there's uh, lots of ways to get in touch. We use discourse in the Jupyter community as a way uh, to keep in touch and have conversations. Uh, so if you're interested in finding out more, have more questions, please join us there. Uh, hi, I'm Lucas uh, from DevSpace, and we're one of the Skydeck cohort teams. Um, we actually met Bill uh, at an advisor meet and greet or one of the office hours, I think. Um, and he invited us uh, to the cloud computing meetup here. Uh, which is uh, very exciting to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Um, and I hope I can uh, talk a little bit about an exciting topic uh, about the product that we're building. Part of it is open source, part of it is proprietary, um, and we're dealing with no ops Kubernetes. Essentially, um, the idea behind DevSpace is that a user that wants to make use of Kubernetes needs to set up a cluster. Setting up and maintaining a cluster is a lot of work or costs a lot of money. Um, but actually, a regular user just wants to deploy applications, just wants to use um, deployments, services, ingresses, and Kubernetes. And we allow that to users without having them 
to set up their own cluster, managing their own cluster without getting all this stress. Um, but let's first take a look um, at uh, what my team's made of. So we have two uh, other co-founders here. My name is Lucas, and then there's also uh, Fabian, my CTO, uh, C CTO, who's here too. Uh, and then Daniel, which handles a kind of business side of things in our startup. We have a couple of advisors, um, like Abby Kearns, uh, head of Cloud Foundry, uh, Michael Aday, which works for Huawei, um, and Mona Sabet, uh, which has a venture firm. Um, and we are very happy to be part of uh, Berkeley Skydeck Accelerator. Uh, we're actually a team from Germany, so I'm in a national team. So if I'm pronouncing things uh, kind of funny, that's where it comes from. <laughs> So uh, we just moved here in January, currently transforming our company to a US entity. Um, and uh, yeah, we're hoping to build the future of cloud native. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about why cloud native is important. There have been plenty of studies showing that companies adopting cloud technologies. According to KPMG, 65% of companies already use cloud technologies. 25% uh, of them 25% uh, of developers use Docker, and 75% of them uh, say that accelerates their workflow. So not only cloud-native is important, but also containers, cloud-native technologies, everything that the cloud-native foundation, uh, computing foundation stands for. Um, and what is very important, a lot of new technologies are cloud-only, um, as, as, as Gartner says here. So leading-edge computing technology is more often cloud-only, that's why we really need to care uh, about moving towards cloud technologies. So why am I talking about Kubernetes? Well, I'm just showing this quote here from uh, Jim Semlin, the director of the Linux Foundation, saying Kubernetes is becoming the Linux of the cloud. So kind of like the operating system for running cloud um, computing technologies um, is Kubernetes, or Kubernetes will be this technology really leveraging um, the cloud. And you can see in the in the background, the Google Trends chart um, for the search term Kubernetes, it's so it's really exploding the adoption of Kubernetes. So why is Kubernetes exploding? Um, well, first of all, we can accelerate build processes, we can accelerate deployments with it, so we can essentially get faster releases with Kubernetes. Uh, we can handle infrastructure as code in a way with Kubernetes. Um, we get zero downtime, rolling updates, and this infinite scalability from uh, adopted from companies like Oh, it actually works, not great. <laughs> uh, from companies like uh, uh, Google and Amazon and IBM, which help to build Kubernetes. So we can learn from their best practices. And we have a reduced <coughs> vendor lock-in because Kubernetes is very portable. I mean, Kubernetes runs on AWS. It runs with one click on GCP. It also runs on your bare metal clusters. It runs in hybrid scenarios. It's so flexible in terms of deployment that it really allows this vision of completely portable applica applications across platforms. And that's why more and more industry leaders build on Kubernetes to outperform their competitors. So why aren't you using Kubernetes yet? <laughs> um, well, when we ask that to uh, people we meet, um, the most common answer is Kubernetes is very complicated. It's too complicated for us, we don't want to deal with it. Maybe that's because we talk to a lot of small companies, a lot of startups, or a lot of um, small innovation teams in, in larger companies, um, that's a very common answer. Another answer is we have no time to migrate. Our systems are running on AWS, um, they have, uh, we have our instances there, we have our pipelines there, we can't move to Kubernetes, it's a lot of effort to migrate. Um, and another common issue is we don't have an ops team really knowing how to operate Kubernetes, we really know how to manage Kubernetes. Um, and those problems um, are actually real. So that is not something that is just a perception of people. It is there, Kubernetes is very complicated. Uh, you need a lot of experience to run it, and it takes time to migrate. Uh, and that's why we start an open source project called Deathspace CLI to, make, to, to kind of mitigate those issues. Deathspace CLI is a Swiss army knife for Kubernetes. It helps you containerize any project very quickly, move it to Kubernetes, then deploy it on top of Kubernetes, debug it on top of Kubernetes, and if you're really advanced, uh, really um, looking for the adrenaline, you can also develop stuff directly on top of Kubernetes cluster. Um, so that's the ultimate step, that we don't build stuff in our local environment, build on top of Kubernetes too. Um, DevSpace CLI is open source, it's on GitHub, uh, it has an Apache license, has more than 1,200 commits so far, 
and has over four, uh, 500 GitHub stars. Um, so if you're wondering why you're a startup, so you're probably not just uh, uh, doing open source software. Uh, we also have a platform which is called DevSpace Cloud, which offers hosted Kubernetes namespaces. So very easily you can get a namespace instead of an entire cluster. You can do everything in that namespace. Um, you can create this namespace, have automatic SSL, have automatic uh, domain connections. Um, you have an inbuilt private registry, and you have full access with kubectl, helm, and all the other tools in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So in this namespace, you're really the master of it. You're, you're the admin, you can do whatever you want. Um, one space is free, so it's very easy to try out. Uh, and we're currently working on getting DevSpace Cloud on-prem too, um, so that actually a company can say, we want to offer that service to our development teams without having to use your hosted solution. So they take DevSpace Cloud, install it on their Kubernetes cluster, it works on any Kubernetes cluster, and then they can provide that service for the development teams. And from a user point of view, um, DevSpace CLI and DevSpace Cloud work very well together. So there's only one command um, in DevSpace CLI which is tied to DevSpace Cloud, and that's DevSpace create space, which actually creates a namespace, isolates that namespace um, within a Kubernetes cluster, but all the rest is usable within the CLI tool. Um, and that's what, I'm, uh, what I want, you to want to show you right now. Um, so this project here is a regular React applica application. React is a front-end framework, so it might not be the best use case for running on top of Kubernetes, but it's very easy to, to demonstrate with, um, with, with React um, because it's very easy to set up. Um, and if we have this project here, we see on the left-hand side it has no Docker file, it's not a containerized application. So the only thing I did before the session, I ran npx create React app. That's a standard way of creating a React application, it just says hello world, nothing else. Um, and I installed DevSpace CLI, obviously. So if I want to uh, containerize this project with um, DevSpace uh, CLI, I just run um, I just run um, DevSpace Containerize. And what DevSpace is doing now, it detects my programming language. So it takes a look at my project, analyzes my project, and then asks a couple of questions. Uh, for example, it asks, select the programming language of your project. Already um, detected, we're using JavaScript here, but we can also switch to Python, or we can say none in case of uh, it did, didn't provide the correct language over here. And it will create some basic template which you need to um, work on with. But in case of JavaScript, we have a working version, um, so we can just uh, select JavaScript here, and um, you can see here that what it's done now, it, it, it created a um, Docker file over here. Oh, actually, I'm in the wrong, um, sorry, I'm in the wrong bit, actually. So let me repeat that. Um, So now we have a Docker file over here. Uh, you see that it's now a Git repository, so you can actually see the files that have changed. Uh, we see there's Docker ignore file and Docker file. Um, this Docker file is very basic. Um, it just um, yeah, inherits from a node image, um, then creates a folder app in our image, um, marks that as a working directory. It copies the package JSON, uh, which kind of defines the application, the dependencies. Then it installs the dependencies with npm install, then it copies the rest of the application code, um, and then it starts our application, so it marks the entry point uh, as npm start. Um, if we run our initializing command, that's space in it now, um, we will also see that a new folder has been created, chart, and that's actually where Helm chart will be placed in. Um, there's one further question that DevSpace is asking us, which port is the application listening on? For uh, React applications, that's port 3000, so I'm just confirming the default um, port here. Um, and then there's this question, do we want to use DevSpace Cloud or do we want to use our own cluster? So if you're already having kubectl installed, um, if you're already connected to your root cloud cluster, you can just say no, deploy it to your own namespace and work with DevSpace CLI without DevSpace Cloud. Um, but if your organization in the future is using DevSpace Cloud Enterprise or you're using DevSpace Cloud as a free version, um, you can just go ahead and say yes here. 
uh, a login window pops up and we just log in with GitHub. Now we're logged in and go back to the command line and we see our project is initialized. Uh, we have this configuration folder here, uh, .dev space. We have this chart folder here which defines how our application is deployed to Kubernetes. And now we can very easily run um, that space, create space. Um, that space, create space react in this case, um, which creates a new namespace in that space cloud. As I said, if you're not using that space cloud, this step is not necessary. Um, but if you are, um, then you can very easily get a Kubernetes namespace now. Um, and then we can run um, that space deploy to actually deploy our application to this newly created namespace. And what DevSpace is doing right now, it authenticates towards the Docker registry. Um, in this case, it uses the Docker registry of DevSpace Cloud, but we can also in the configuration tell it, push it to Docker Hub, push it to our GitLab uh, registry. Any, really any Docker registry would work in this case. It authenticates with the local credentials, uh, so you can just log in with, with Docker login. Um, and our application uh, is built as an image, pushed to this registry, and deployed to Kubernetes. Um, and the last step would be to say, that space open, uh, which actually opens our application. So it takes a look at the um, ingress that we have defined, and it sees the URL that our application is connected to. And as soon as the application is ready, our pods are started, our image is pulled, it will open um, up a URL where we can actually see the application running. Um, if we want to check the status um, of our deployment, um, we can also use kubectl for that. So whenever you run, oh, actually we see the application running now, um, so it took me probably just like three, four minutes um, to get this React application running um, on top of Kubernetes and you really need a minimum of Kubernetes uh, experience of that. Actually, you only need a little bit of knowledge about your application. You need to know the programming language, you need to know the port, and it creates all the resources that you need. And the great thing is that that space doesn't limit you to anything. So it's not like, I mean, you can deploy applications with Heroku just in a minute. Uh, you just run two or three console commands and install the CLI, but then you're locked in to Heroku. In our case, we have a Docker file now, we have a Helm chart now, we can deploy it to any Kubernetes cluster. It's really just standard, so we're not, uh, we're not changing anything in your application, you don't have to adapt anything, we don't lock you in. It's pure Kubernetes resources, pure Docker file, and it would work with any CI CD pipeline. Um, <coughs> and the cool thing is, if we have um, kubectl installed, um, we can actually um, take a look, for example, at the pods in our namespace, um, and see that we have a Tiller service running, um, we're deploying Helm charts, uh, so we have this server-side component called Tiller, which actually runs our applications, and then we have our application running in a pod, you can see here the default 778 and so on, um, which, which contains um, the, uh, the pod which runs our containers, um, and it's very easy to directly access that Kubernetes namespace uh, without even going through um, without even going through um, dev space. So you could extend this in any way you want. It's compatible uh, to any standard um, Kubernetes procedures and other CLI tools that you might already be using or that you find later on and want to use. Um, and that's really the power of it. And there's a couple of other uh, convenience commands that you can see here. Um, there's, for example, dev space analyze, which automatically analyzes issues with your application. So let's say our application wouldn't start correctly. Uh, our pod would keep on crashing, our container uh, would have an error lock and would crash all the time, um, then we need to uh, see which pod is crashing, get the logs of that, and it's a lot of repetitive work. Or let's say a service doesn't have an endpoint, um, we have to first get a list of services, see, um, get a list of endpoints, um, see which endpoints are not mapping to the service. All these kinds of checks that you would have to do if your application is not showing up on the intended URL, um, those checks are all inside of DevSpace Analyze. So DevSpace Analyze checks all these things in parallel and just gives you um, a report of issues uh, which really show you the problems. So for example, if the entry point is not working, DevSpace Analyze will tell you this part has issues with the entry point, this image is not working, this was the last log output. 
Um, and then it's very easy to fix that. And it doesn't take 20 minutes to find out where actually is the issue in Kubernetes. Um, and uh, there's a couple of other commands like logs and enter to actually open a terminal. Um, and as I said, there is one more command uh, which is called dev space dev, um, which actually starts our application in development mode. So what happens here is it's a very similar procedure to the deployment um, with the difference that we overwrite the entry points of the images. That means we do not actually start the containers correctly, uh, we start them in a sleep mode. That means the containers uh, are there, the application is packaged in there, but it's not being started. Uh, and with that by step, we see here that we also do port forwarding for the port that we specified beforehand and for a couple of other ports that we may specify later. Um, and we do a code synchronization between our local repository um, and uh, the remote containers. And now we're actually in a terminal inside the running pod, inside the running container, which has not started an application yet. And you can see beforehand we marked slash app as a working directory. We end up in that directory and can now run npm start here to start our React application. And then our React application starts up inside the container that runs remotely. And then we can easily change any JavaScript file and it will be directly synchronized in the container and our application will restart. So if you have a hot reloading tool like Node1 for example, um, I think for Flask and, and other Python tools, um, they have that tool for most actually web frameworks that would work very easily. If I change a file, the application hot reloads and we don't need to rebuild the image, restart the container and that saves a lot of time if we're actually debugging issues um, that might happen if we have four or five microservices which communicate with each other, which is very hard to reproduce in a local um, local, local uh, development environment. Um, actually running uh, React always takes a couple of seconds. So we'll see there. Are loading screen right now. And there we go. And now uh, we have the output of this React application in the development mode. And we can just exact access that application on localhost just as it would running on our local machine. If I change a file now, it will automatically reload, restart the application, and we can also test it again on localhost. And this port forwarding is very interesting because we can also attach remote debuggers very easily without worrying about authentication. I can just tell my Visual Studio code in this case uh, to listen on localhost port 6675. Uh, to listen to the debugger, start that debugger in the container too, and actually remote debug inside a Kubernetes environment. So you can see there's a lot of possibilities how to use DevSpace CLI and DevSpace Cloud as a kind of an extension to make it even easier for users to get started with, um, with Kubernetes. And uh, if you have any questions uh, regarding the open source project, regarding DevSpace Cloud, regarding Skylake and the program, uh, just come up to me later on. I'm really happy to chat. Thank you.